Ladies and gentlemen, let us begin our morning lecture session. I would like to ask Professor Rudolf Gruber, who will be the chairman of the first plenary session, to the stage. May I ask you? Okay. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> Don't clap your hands for me. Um, it is a great pleasure and an even greater honor uh, to present and introduce the first plenary speaker of this conference, Professor Friedrich Götze, from the University of Bielefeld in Germany. Friedrich Götze is one of the internationally outstanding mathematicians from the area of probability theory. There are several impressive act aspects of his work that, in my view, go beyond counting publications and citations. One of these is his broad range of research results and scientific activities, which ranges from mathematical statistics to number theory. I think this is about going from completely blue from to completely red as far as the spectrum is concerned. Now, a running threat in his interest is uh, our inequalities and asymptotic expansions, and these are often related to the central limit theory. And indeed, his lecture today will be, will be about expansions related to the entropic central limit theory. Okay, will you please begin? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure and an even greater honor to give the opening lecture of this first meeting of the Polish and German Mathematics Society. So um, I will talk about, as you see, uh, some topics in probability and related to classical uh, functionals like entropy. And uh, so I know that uh, Usually there is a problem if you talk uh, about things in probability, there is a special language uh, which is used uh, to simplify somehow notations and presentations and I will hopefully try to convince you that one can understand the things I'm talking about which are very classical in some sense, also on with the general knowledge of analysis rather than the special notions of probability. So the topics I will touch here are uh, approximations in the central limit theorem. So I will just introduce and review to you the classical central limit theorems at in refinements based on some harmonic analysis representation. Then I will come to entropic distance. It's a method to prove the central limit theorem or to understand it in terms of entropy and see how you can refine that. And the same is somehow a variation of that is the Fisher information distance, which is uh, somehow a differential form of entropy used prominently in mathematical statistics. And then I change gears, so to speak, to a seemingly different field, which uh, was originated by Dan Wojkulescu and comes uh, from von Neumann algebras and uh, uh, C-star algebras, so an area which is prominently represented in, as a topic of research in Poland, and it's called free probability. And there uh, we will look at non-classical convolutions, free convolutions, and uh, then again there is an analogous notion introduced by Wojkulescu about free entropy and also free Fisher information. Now, let's start with this very classical topic, the central limit theorem for convolutions. So, uh, you start just with the density, and of course, central limit theorems is usually taught in uh, cl cl introductory classes as by coin tossings, but for the things uh, I'm talking here about, it is, uh, we will uh, restrict to densities. So densities are positive functions which integrate to one. And what we will look at is rescalings of these densities by a certain factor. And then we will have two uh, points here. That is um, 
so-called moments, that is the integral of x with the density to the first, the second, and other powers, and a standard way of uh, standardizing these densities by scale and shift is to assume that the mean is zero and the variance or second moment in this case is one. So in convolution now is easily understood as this uh, additive uh, integral. And here I'm just defined you the n-fold convolution as an iteration of uh, p folded with itself. Now, the center limit theorem, not in the combinatorial way, which is, again, another 200 years, nearly 200 years earlier, was started with Chebyshev, Markov, Lyapunov, and uh, in another way by Lindeberg uh, in uh, the end of the uh, 19th century. And it can be formulated as follows. And here I will just uh, mark in red the jargon of uh, probability. So we, we take a test function to integrate. And we take, in probability, we say we take a sum of uh, identical distributed independent random variables scaled by the factor n to the minus 1 half. Now, in uh, analysis terms, this means I'm integrating this test function with respect to the n-fold convolution of this rescaled density, which I can then uh, reformulate as the integral of this density of the sum divided by uh, rescaled by the square root over the product of densities. Now, the short term in stochastics for this type of uh, integral is just the expectation, and usually you don't write a p here because you think you know what your density are of the observation, and you put in here your refi rescaled uh, sum zn. Now, this one is a multi uh, an n-fold integral, and there's a limit to it, which is the Gaussian density phi for this density of the n-fold convolution. And so I get, when integrating with respect to this test function, I get approximately the integral over the Gaussian density plus a certain remainder which goes to zero as n goes to infinity, provided you have a second moment here. Now, uh, this can be sharpened a little bit to take for the test function a delta function, and then you get what's called local limit theorem, namely the rescaled n-fold convolution of densities converges point-wise to the normal density. I hope so far central limit theorem is uh, clear also to people who never looked at the stochastics way of representing it. So what I want to do first is just, uh, any talk should contain a little proof, um, a very short review how you get to this result in analytic terms, not just uh, for its own sake, but because I want to confront this derivation of the central limit theorem with the more, little bit uh, differently looking way of doing n-fold convolutions in free probability. So what the result of this n-fold convolution is, is here uh, picked in uh, with the blue one is, uh, that's a gamma density, which is zero uh, on the left side. Uh, then I convolve it with, I have a nice exact formula for that, and the green curve which is symmetric around zero, that's Gaussian limit, and then you see for five and 30 iterations of the convolution, you start at first not very nicely, but then more better and better to approximate the blue, uh, the red, the green curve of the normal density if you iterate that. So you see there's what statisticians would call a bias, of course, in the beginning, but which goes away after some iterations. Now, the calculations, which is, is very easy and you learn it in courses of probability, namely you take as a function a character, uh, so the classical uh, character on the real line, the exponential of uh, square root of minus one ts. So that's a family of sines and cosines uh, indexed by t. 
and you introduce some moment quantities, and then what, what you get when you integrate now uh, the n-fold convolution with this character, you get the uh, Fourier transform of this n-fold convolution. And of course, there's a simple formula for that. That's the power of uh, the convolution uh, of the Fourier transform of the rescaled density. Now, if you would like to jump to formal conclusion, you would say, well, this is a nice functional equation. And if I just do something I'm not allowed usually because this uh, transform may be zero, I take a logarithm of that, I get a homomorphism. That is, the n-fold or a two-fold convolution under a logarithm goes to the addition of the logs. Now, this sounds like a, a little bit silly observation, but please keep that in mind because later on we go to free probability and learn about another homomorphism which just has the same, uh, pro uh, same properties. Now, one, then one proceeds quite easily by taking this rescaled variable, integrating with x, and ex uh, expanding this uh, exponential around zero, getting some terms here, it squared gives a minus, then I have a next term, raising it to the power n, and then your usual reflex is taking the logarithm of that in the exponent with a result which is, looks like that. It's an exp minus t squared over 2, and then a certain remainder term. So as n goes to infinity, this term vanishes in the limit, and you know, you get the results that the Fourier transform of your n-fold convolution converges to x to the minus t squared of one half, which is the characteristic, the transform of the standard normal density. So in that, in a few lines, you already have the classical central limit theorems for densities. And of course, you can start refining that by uh, looking at the remainder term and seeing, yes, you can expand it formally if all the moments exist into a series. This should be infinity, sorry. Um, and which involves all the moments. And if you now plug that in, uh, this L is a polynomial in some quantities gamma L. The PK now appearing here, if you expand that out, are also polynomials in this uh, constants gamma L, which we will discuss in a moment, and powers of it. So that would be a refinement of the lo uh, local central limit theorem by these uh, powers of n, negative powers of n minus one half, and some uh, polynomials in the frequency variables. And that is usually called an asymptotic expansion around the uh, limiting normal density. So that's very easy in a few lines you can uh, just convince yourself that these things exist. Now, what are these uh, constants which appear here? They have a very, uh, if you do now a formal expansion, disregarding convergence, then you can uh, expand uh, the characteristic function, the characteristic transform, the Fourier transform in an infinite series in moments, take the logarithm and formally get another formal power series where the gamma Ls are now functions of the moments, polynomials of the moments, and they are called the cumulants, semi-invariants, there are various names used for that. And the first ones, if the mean is zero and this first moment uh, is the same as, uh, is, is positive, is the first uh, semi-invariant or cumulant is zero, the second is the same as the second moment, the third is the same as the third moment, but then it starts changing at the fourth cumulant, which is m4 minus 3m squares. Now, if these cumulant vanishes, vanish starting at index 3, then all these uh, terms here in the exponent and the terms here, they vanish as well, and we have that the n-fold convolution is indeed a normal distribution. So vanishing of cumulants, of higher cumulants, means normality. And smallness of cumulants, as we know from statistics, means nearness to normality. Okay, so uh, now this is all extremely classical. 
And there are also the local limit theorems were around by thanks to the efforts of uh, the Lithuanian, Russian, and also Polish school of probabilities in the 40s and, and 50s. But there was, for our work, one case missing, surprisingly, namely that you have a moment condition which the moment is not an integer but just an arbitrary real number. This looks like uh, a technical oversight in the otherwise extensive literature, but it has uh, unpleasant uh, problems in proving, so you have to go to fractional calculus, etc., to prove a local limit theorem like that, which I just sketched here. The n-fold convolution is the normal density times some uh, terms which I get from the characteristic function expansion by Fourier inversion. And what do I get here? I get another polynomial with involved and involved constants are these cumulants, and I have some depending on the length of the expansion and the number of moments of your distribution, I have some error terms. Note that the approximation decays extremely fast, but we have only s moments, that is the tails of your density don't go as fast to zero as a normal distribution. So there's a discrepancy between the size of the approximation for large values and the bound for large values. And that is of importance later. And what are the terms? Well, these are the cumulants times the Hamid polynomials and combinations thereof. Now this is the local limit approximations we will need. But now to the topic of the talk, the uh, general expansion. So, the, but before I come to the, um, to the entropy, let me uh, just put this whole thing into a certainly more general perspective. And this general perspective at first looks like, well, you know, it's very simple. What do I need now? Another way of looking at this. But for many expansions, we don't have to deal with simple operations like these classical convolutions. They are more complicated functions we want to investigate rather than the sum. That is quadratic forms, other nonlinear combinations of variables. And for that, it is good to have a more general view of these limit theorems. So the idea to do this is just to make all these scalings different. So this is a usual technique that I make things non-identical. I use non-identical scalings from my variables. And I do this convolution of arbitrary rescaled things in this example. And then I'm looking what these type of functions, what type of properties are enjoyed by this sequence of functions. And that is something like, well, if you put one of these of the weights to zero, you get a function of one argument less. It's obviously symmetric. If you take derivatives at, at weight zero, you get zero coming from the mean zero in these examples. And if tau is smooth and you have enough moments, I have uniform boundedness on certain domains depending on n. So this is obvious what you think. Not so obvious, but possible is to take these three type of statements now uh, formulated in a more uh, uh, precise way and say whenever I have such a sequence, can I find the limit theorems and expansions around the limit theorem? Answer is yes. This is something in the domain of sequences of adaptive or sequences of symmetric functions where symmetry is one I have the symmetric group in the limit a uh, symmetric group is approximated by the unitary group on the sphere, so I have only one invariant, that's the norm of the sphere, and that gives me one term, this is the H infinity, and then I have some kind of a character expansion, one would say in algebra, uh, around that uh, functions of a square of the weights, which are these so-called edgeworth expansion, and these are nothing else but differential operators, towards, with respect to a function h, infinity of some variables, which are obtained as follows. I keep some of the weights large, and the other ones I make uniformly small, rescale them, and increase their size as n goes to infinity. 
So I can prove there is a limit under these differentiabilities. These are the H infinities. And I can derive this limit. And interestingly enough, almost all limit theorems in which Gaussian processes uh, invariance principles or whatever are, Gauss Gaussianity is in the background, can be formulated like that. And the advantage here is you don't have to know uh, how the Gaussian process enters into this. You just know by basic principles that this thing exists on, this, on the basis of this. So this is more or less like a categorical approach in some sense. And we will see how that helps. Now, entropy enters. Let me interest you. Entropy, so we have now x to have a certain distribution mu. We have a second moment. Then we have a mean, a variance. And let p be a density of mu because we need densities to define the entropy. And one observation of the entropy, it's maximal among all distributions, all distributions with given mean and given variance, this entropy functional is maximized by the Gaussian distribution with this mean and variance. And since this is maximized, I can take uh, z to be a normal random variable with this normal density, and then define the distance to normality by this maximized quantity for the Gaussian case minus the entropy for another random variables having the same mean invariance. So this is called uh, relative entropy. It enjoys a nice uh, number of facts here. It's translation and scale invariant, and it's a strictly convex functional, so it's zero if and only if uh, x is normal. And it's also in statistics called the kullback leipler distance. To of mu, of course, to any normal law. Now, if x1 and x1 are IID, meaning that they have the distribution mu to the n, the product distribution, as outlined before, then if I take the distance of this n-fold convolution to normality, so d, this is monotone uh, in n, monotone decreasing, uh, monotone increasing uh, in n, uh, decreasing in n, sorry, and this was proved by Archstein, Keyes, Ball, Baron, Merriman in two papers some time ago. Now to the way of, other way of looking at the center limit theorem rather than by harmonic analysis. So you have again this independent random variables. Is, this means you have the product distribution for the joint distribution of that. You have mean uh, M2. And Andrew Barron proved some time ago a nice result, saying, well, I take the n-fold convolution. It converges to zero uh, if and only if the distance to normality is defined, starting at a certain number of convolution. So, and so two conditions, I have second moment, and the distance is defined at all. Then it is monotone and goes to zero to normality. So this is a very pleasant theorem. It has pre-runners by work of Linick long time ago and Larry Brown in 1982. Now the question of course was arising how fast does this uh, distance, this uh, center limit theorem works, I mean how large is the distance, and if there x satisfies a certain uh, additional quantities like so-called Poincaré type inequality where the variance is bounded of a function is bounded by the L2 norm of its derivative, then one could show that yes, this converges to zero, this distance in the number of convolutions by one over n. Okay, this is due to a number of people, again, Artstein, Kiesbohl, and uh, now Barron and Johnson. But the requirements of Poincaré are some different higher some other functionals like Fisher information which we talk about and arbitrary moments should be finite. So what we did some time ago now is in la, actually last year is we looked at that from uh, using other techniques and the other groups of authors namely uh, harmonic analysis and we assume now that we have distribution mu we have a any moment 
not integer any less larger than two. We assume that an n zero-fold convolution has a finite, ent uh, finite entropic distance. Then we take this integer value of this uh, real quantity, and then we have an expansion. It starts with one over one over n, one over n squared, with certain constants and a remainder term. And that is only under the condition that an n zero-fold uh, distance makes sense for the n zero fold convolution, and I have an s moment. So, for instance, if s is equal to four, I have uh, the first term, so a c1 and one with a remainder term. And the cj are functions of cumulants. For instance, the first one is one twelfth, the third cumulant squared. Now, there are lots of extensions to that. This is not confined to the real line only. It can be extended to the Euclidean case. Uh, this is, and there comes the fact that I insisted on having arbitrary moments. Uh, if I have moments between two and three, one shows up to a logarithmic factor. This bound, which we get here, is more or less up to a logarithmic factor sharp. And one can make the bounds also explicit. If you want to know, let's say, in the general case, I have p densities, which are non, maybe different, but each one has a finite uh, entropy, so I have a maximal entropy which is bounded by d, then I also have an explicit bound uh, by this, what is in stochastics called a Lyapunov fraction. So I can really bound things very uh, explicitly in terms of, uh, of convolutions and their properties, namely the only quantity beside the moment which plays a role here, that's the fourth moment we need here, is the entropies of the densities. Now there's a related density or related distance to entropy which is sometimes called differentiable. Uh, entropy, which plays a very important role in efficient estimations uh, in statistics, which is called Fisher information. And the Fisher information is the L2 distance of the logarithmic derivative of a density. And so it is a convex functional, so you put it infinity if it doesn't exist. And a famous inequality in statistics, the so-called Kramer-Rao inequality says for all densities with given mean and variance, there is a minimization going on for the Gaussian density with this mean and variance. And this is a strictly convex functional again, so I have uh, equality of Fisher information here if and only if I have a normal density. So that makes sense to define the relative Fisher information, which is then the difference of the Fisher information, which by partial integration, because this quotient here is just a linear, x minus uh, a divided by sigma squared, uh, partial integration will give you that, this identity. So it's an L2 norm of the difference of logarithmic derivatives. Now, this is a little bit larger inequality. Stamm proved in 59 that it dominates the entropic distance. And uh, it was shown by Linick uh, in, in, under stronger condition, Baron and Johnson, that again, such a principle holds that if fish information converges to Fisher information of the Gaussian density, if and only if Fisher information after a few convolutions is finite. Okay, what we did is now the analog, so I go through we have now, uh, because Fisher information is not scale invariant, we have to renormalize everything. We assume that uh, this is finite for some n0, then we have an expansion. The expansion has, again, coefficients, which are form, uh, polynomials in cumulants, and we can make also uh, effective estimates, let's say, for four moments. And for s equals 6, this coefficient involves some uh, polynomial, which gets very simple if the first third cumulant vanishes. Okay, so what goes into this? Now, this sounds like, well, if you can do one thing, you can do the other. But interestingly, 
since Fisher information is being used for parametric families for more than eight or 10 decades, let's say, since the beginning of mathematical statistics, uh, the uh, interesting way how Fisher information behaves under convolution doesn't seem to have received much attention. So we were uh, interested, uh, had to start somehow from scratch. Uh, and one of the things was, well, when is Fisher information of a few convolutions is finite? And the, um, the result is if it has a, a continuously differentiable densities and its total variation is finite. But it should be continuously differentiable here. And one of the main inequalities, which is not trivial, was that if we have total uh, variation finite and we have the convolution of two densities, it doesn't suffice to have Fisher information bounded. We need three. And there's an inequality between just you need three total variation distances for densities to bound Fisher information. Moreover, if you have five, convolution of five, then you have uh, another classical uh, representation of Fisher information by using a second derivative, which is uh, well known in statistics. And of course, once you have the Fisher information, you can bound all kinds of characteristics of your density. For instance, the maximal value of your, uh, you can bound the maximal value of your density with S uh, order moment in a very explicit way. You can bound characteristic functions and many things more. Now, the methods involved are somehow decomposition. I take a general density, which may be arbitrarily large, and truncate it somewhat, pe peeling off one part, taking a binomial expansion of these two parts, and singling out up to a small error a good part, which has a bounded density. I've put this bounded density in the local limit theorem, but the problem is that, uh, as I said, this bound here is much larger than the approximation for large x, so you have to stop somewhere because it doesn't make sense. The approximation is much smaller than that, so you have to stop. And the interesting point is you have to be very careful in where you stop using this. And for the rest of the entropy, where you don't use the local limit theorem, so the to approximate this quotient by one, you have to use some inequalities and last but not least, so-called moderate deviation results. So that is just in short some of the techniques. But let me say that this row n goes very slowly to infinity. If you take it a little bit larger or smaller, some of these arguments fail. So it's on the brink of being provable uh, by harmonic analysis. Uh, so now, shift gears, free probability. Uh, so here it is a question about spectral measures. Suppose we have two spectral measures, nu1, nu2, it's compact support, and we produce some approximation of this spectra by discrete spectra, so empirical measures, uh, on, and the empirical measures are generated by the eigenvalues of n by n Hamitian matrices, a n for the first measure, b n for the second, so I make approximations. Then I take a unitary, uh, I take uni ha measure on the unitary group, n goes to infinity to make this approximation of these two measures better and better. And then what I'm doing, I'm somehow wrote, uh, putting an into a general position to the uh, Hermitian matrix bn and then looking at its spectrum. And lo and behold, what happens if n goes to infinity, it doesn't matter what rotation, we, it has just to be in a general position with respect to bn. I go to a deterministic limit in a distance metrizing weak Convergence. So this is a stochastic way of saying, well, usually you don't know what happens if you add one Hermitian matrix to another or to the spectrum. But if you put them into a general position to each other, in the sense let n go to infinity, you can find a deterministic law of addition of spectra in this sense. 
And now this operation is uh, commutative and associative, and surprise, it has a density with respect to Lebesgue measure, this new spectral addition, provided that I have two or three iterations of uh, convolution of this type. Now, where does it come from? Well, of course, one of the things where it comes from is the smoothness, the smoothing factor here is the n times when h measure as n goes to infinity. It inserts into a spectrum which is a projector which has only two values, zero and one, some kind of smoothness automatically by this operation. And therefore, the new uh, sum spectrum has to be continuous, much more continuous than the original ones. So uh, we have densities again, but now what is the analytic treatment of that here? This is, of course, not the characteristic function, but uh, in this case, it is a Cauchy transform, which formally can be expanded also in uh, a moment series. And, of course, from the Cauchy transform, you have the cauchy stiltius inversion, you get back the measure, the spectral measure, on open intervals. And you know if it's probability measure, you know the behavior at infinity, at, if that goes to infinity of the Cauchy transform for limits not along the real line. And since this is a nice function at infinity, you have an inverse at infinity, functional inverse in the complex domain around zero. So that you have uh, this, this equation, but this is only partially defined in the upper half plane. And Voiculescu now introduced the so-called R-transform and free cumulants. And the R-transform is this inverse, so the logarithm, if you remind, if I may I remind you, is also an inverse, minus one over Z, which can be expanded formally in a power series, and here appear new quantities, the so-called free cumulants. So just similarity to the beginning. And so this function maps zero into zero and should be analytic around zero. And now the log additivity for characteristic function is played by the additivity here of the so-called Voiculescu R transform under free. You, you could take it because uh, this R transform characterizes the spectral measure uniquely, uh, although this identity is only valid on the intersection of the domain of common definition, but you can take this as a definition of free convolution even, to go back by this inverse uh, device. Now, free central limit theorem. Now, you rescale the measure, you take n-fold free convolution, you expand this characteristic function or R transform by uh, the n-fold way by rescaling and you get a limit z and some remainder. Now what is the significance of z here as a R transform? It is a density which is a famous Wigner half circle density. It's just the graph of, of a half circle line and well, you can evenly see that the limit of the free convolution density is the Wigner law, this Wigner law, that is the free central limit theorem. So we have now a compact limit rather than a Gaussian one. And now, uh, but how do we get expansions? This is a little bit more complicated. Here I introduce now, again, a more general scaling, rescaling of my measure called d epsilon mu, takes a free convolution and then take a sequence of functions here, which is h epsilon n. And this function you should remember was a function I introduced for this abstract way of defining expansions and limits before. You check the property and what you get is now jointly with a graduate student, Reshitenko, in her thesis, you assume for that you have a bounded, uh, have a bounded support, and then you get an expansion which looks like this by this general scheme. It's a derivative of uh, some polynomial, some further polynomial of the Wigner uh, density. And UK are here the Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind, and for the Poisson case where you can prove 
uh, know what the exact iteration of free convolution is, you see now here for uh, n equals 10 and 100 the slow convergence, where you have to, of course, exempt the boundary of the spectrum, of the limiting spectrum, from the convergence, because there it's rather bad, and you need lots of iterations. Now, uh, we did now to carry on the approximation around the boundary, we used other methods, this jointly with Gennady Chistyakov, and here you have to rescale everything because the boundary plus minus two is a difficult point there, the density, limiting density vanishes, you have to transform everything, and this EN somehow is a rescaled domain nearly plus minus two, and what you get then is in L1 norm a difference of this new N density with the Wigner density uh, of ordered M3 divided by squared N, and if M3 is zero, you have even a one over N. Now you put that in now to free probability, uh, entropy. Now what is this? This looks much different to the log of the quotient of two densities, which you were accustomed to in entropy. This is just the somehow logarithmic density. This comes from physically from uh, somehow electrostatic repulsion uh, potential on the real line, the log x minus y, integrated with the spectral density with itself. And here we have an additive coefficient. And again, why did, uh, uh, why did Wojcolesko call that entropy? Because it's maximized by Wigner, by the Wigner law. And so if uh, under all distributions which have mean zero and variance one. Now the entropic distance you can define is to any other measure nu is then the, again the difference. And you can uh, say, yes, I can rescale it, I can take the n fold free convolution, and I can now develop again the, um, uh, the distance to, to the Wigner law in Wojculesco free entropy as 1 over n. And here it's a, it's a rather technical, difficult thing in, in complex function theory because uh, we would like to have a fourth moment here, but you see we need something more than five at the moment, and the previous result I showed you was just for bounded uh, support. So this is uh, very tough, and the reason why it's much tougher than in the classical case is this is a highly nonlinear operation. You can't just state, ah, I, I truncate my measure, but then the truncation goes in highly nonlinearly in, in, into all these further in taking inverses, etc. So you end up with a lot of problems in, uh, in, the functional, in the function theory to do this. So it's a little bit more. Now what is free Fisher information? Now there we had the L2 norm of the log uh, derivative. Well, it looks a little bit different here. This comes from the um, derivative in, uh, in non-computative analysis or Hilbert transform. And it's just the third power of a density. That's called free Fisher information. And likewise, it's maximized by, maximized under all distribution with the same mean and variance by weakness distribution. And of course, you can do the same thing, namely asking how this uh, free Fisher information is approximating the free Fisher information of uh, the Wigner distribution. It's done by, again, the third cumulant squared. And with this, I would like to close. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>